Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners. Today we have a special guest on the podcast, Lisa Tadejo. Am I pronouncing that right? Tadejo? Tadejo, yes. Perfect. Tadejo. She has written a book called Three Women, and Oprah Magazine calls it an instant feminist classic, utterly engrossing and game changing. So I wanted to talk with her about her book. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Thank you for having me, Kirk. So what inspired you to write this book? I had read Gay to Lisa's Thy Neighbor's Wife. So it was written in 1980. It was uh, taking the pulse of sexuality back in the 70s, a lot of the swinger culture, and Mr. Talese, who is a very well-respected journalist in the journalism community, had spent about a decade, much as I did, um, immersing himself in the notion, in the sort of field of, of sexuality across the country. And he participated in the swingers' colonies and participated in happy ending massage parlors and managing one himself. And so it was very immersive in multiple ways. And while I admired the immersive aspect of it, I also found that it was very told from a very male perspective, a very heterosexual male perspective. And I wondered what a book about desire might look like told from a female perspective. So for those of you who want to get this book, again, it's called Three Women, and it's about three women, three real life women that Lisa interviewed and did a lot of background research around. And they each tell a different story about how their relationships evolved over time, how their sexuality evolved over time. One of the questions I have is, what are the lessons that you learned uh, from these women's experiences? One of the main takeaways that I had was that judgment is so prevalent across all genders, all races, all sexual proclivities. But I found it in women the most and in heterosexual women predominantly. And I, it's not that I focused on these three women for any specific reason other than the fact that they were the most willing to talk to me about their desire, to talk to me about their fears and passions. And one of the things I found that was that the judgment surrounding these women was, was so great that I think that's one of the reasons that they wanted someone to talk to, someone who would not judge them. So they felt extremely judged regarding their sexuality specifically or, or other things as well? Yes, sexuality specifically, um, the way that they, yes, sexuality specifically, but also other aspects. And for example, there's Lena, the, the housewife in rural Indiana, who wants to have a better marriage or a better love life, a better sex life. And because she had a house that was nice and, and large enough and bigger than most people's in the area and healthy children and a husband with a job who fixed things around the house that was considered enough. And the, so, so while her desire for when she ended up wanting to sleep with this other man, that this former lover from high school, the judgment around that, it was, it began with the sexual aspect of it, but it also went past that into the, you have all of these things. Why do you need more? Even if your husband doesn't want to be with you intimately, doesn't want to kiss you on the mouth, all of these things, even beyond all that, why are you looking for more? You have all this. Yes. This is the story of Lena. If I remember correctly, she lives as a stay at home mom and her, her husband won't kiss her in the opening uh, flap. You talk about how she goes to their marital therapist and the therapist supports the husband's choice not to, not to kiss her. So she's in a relationship, stay at home mom. And her husband is like, yeah, I don't, it makes me uncomfortable to kiss you. And she doesn't like that. And that, that upsets her. They go to marital therapy. The, the marriage therapist says that's how he feels. So you should respect that. Yeah. You know, and, and the thing, the thing that was the most shocking to her was that the therapist said she didn't put it in these terms that was helpful. She didn't sort of explore past what, which I'm sure you, you are very familiar with. There was no sort of excavation, excavating of, of what that meant to him and why, you know, why he felt that way and why, why he kind of newly felt this way or why, or perhaps he had always felt this way. So there were, she didn't explore any of those things, Lena related, which, which she said, 
her last sort of like final line on the matter was, that's okay. The way that you feel about wet wool is the way your husband feels about kissing you on the mouth. He was that way in general about intimacy, wasn't he? Like a lot of physical intimacy, intimacy was uncomfortable for him. Yes, it was uncomfortable, but it hadn't always been, or at least she didn't notice it having been. So she started to think of all, she would be like, you know, why don't you want to do this anymore? Is it because I had children and my body has changed? So she ended up losing a lot of weight to see if that would, he didn't, he was like, no, no, I just, you know, so there was no communication. And after going to a therapist, there was still, you know, she wasn't really, the therapist wasn't that interested in she, because they're in rural Indiana, there's a lot of siding with, you know, the man, that's something that happens a lot, whether the person is trained not to do that or not. You live where you live and you, you grow up in a certain way and you, it's difficult to come out of that. Right. So then she starts to have an affair on, on Facebook, which eventually um, they actually have a physical affair in reading your book that I was, um, I wanted to ask you just, this is sort of a technical question, but what was it like writing the sex scenes in this book? You know, it, it was, I, I really wanted to walk the line. I wanted to, to not be clinical and not be profane. Um, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be precise. I didn't want to use words like member or, you know, word, the word that starts with a C and ends with a K. I didn't want to use, I didn't want to use words that were too scientific sounding or, or words that were too sort of, you know, not, not sort of part of the, the, um, the English language, not the lexicon, but the sort of, you know, the, and so what I did is I tried to use the words of the women, the words that the women use. I didn't want to put the sex through my lens in a, in a, in a sort of lingual way. And I didn't want it to be, I didn't, I just wanted it to be as real and true to their experiences. And often with Lena, who would tell me, you know, thrust by thrust, what had happened, I often just wrote, there's a, you know, there's one whole section or two pages or so that is just her having sent me a message over Facebook Messenger and I just copied and pasted it and put it in quotes and this is what Lena said. Um, you know, because I just couldn't, I couldn't do it better than her. I couldn't explain her feelings or explain what had just happened physically. So I tried really hard to keep it true to exactly what they had told me, which, which often was written down too, which often was emailed to me and texted to me because we would ask the same questions several different times. And then I would ask them to write it down so that I could see it, what their words were when they perhaps weren't as self-conscious in, in conversation. Interesting. So with Lena specifically, because I imagine there's a lot of people who can relate to her story specifically, long-term marriage, kids, you're at that stage of life where things start to slow down you're starting to look at your life. You're wondering, is this really what I want? Have I ever really asked myself what I want? Has anyone ever asked me what I want? What sort of lesson do you think Lena wants people to pull away from her story? You know, it's funny because she actually would say that often. She One of the reasons she was talking, besides the fact that she had this new crush she wanted to shout about from the rooftops, besides the fact that she had this difficulty with, her marriage and the sort of mourning, the eventual loss of it. Besides those things and the reasons she wanted to talk to someone who would listen and not judge was that she, she wanted people to see that what, what the sort of, what the, what the fallout of judging someone is. So I think her, the takeaway she would want is not to, you know, don't judge someone until you've gone through what they've gone through. And also don't judge someone because it's not you. What right do you have to judge another person? Meaning she was judged for having an affair in general or judged for other sorts of things? Yeah, I think the affair, the affair mostly, but in general it was you have this house, you have this husband, you have these kids, you shouldn't want more. Where she was, she shouldn't want more. In another city, in a bigger city, you might be able to say you want more. If you're a childless woman and your best friend or friend gets pregnant, you might, and then the friend might say, you know what, I just wish I had 
a husband who, you know, uh, said that I was beautiful. Then the other friend might be like, but you are pregnant or you have a child and that's all I want. You should not want more is the sort of underlying emotion. And that's what Lena was experiencing. So then you talk about uh, Maggie's story and her story is that as a teenager, she had a sexual relationship with a teacher who was married incidentally, but so it's a, one of those stories you hear in in the news, Mm -hmm. uh, an abuse story. And she's an adult now. So she, uh, you know, becomes an adult and eventually starts to come forward with her story. And there's a big backlash against her people. You know, the teacher is, is well liked by a lot of people. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but was there a trial also? Yes. And you, you write about the details of that. What lesson is Maggie hoping that people will pull away from her story? Uh, for Maggie, and she's actually heard from so many young women who have been in similar situations, she, she was shamed for, one, she was not believed because the, the trial went in a, in a way that you might imagine it going, especially pre me too, which most of this book was 98% of it was reported and written before the Me Too movement. Um, but with Maggie, nobody really listened to her story. The media was the the media was all skewed in the teacher's defense. The teacher was also awarded North Dakota's Teacher of the Year. So as you can imagine. Maggie was either not believed, and when she was believed, even by her friends, it was like, why is she doing all this? Like, get over it. So you had an affair with your teacher. You know, it's no big deal. You, it was consensual. It was, et cetera. Even if it was, you were underage, it might be statutory rape, but it's consensual. So, um, you know, for her, I think the takeaway would be like, look, you know, I was a child who wanted a not just a my not just a a man to like me, but a, a sort of authority figure and someone who I looked up to so much to say, "Hey, you're worthy. You're not just worthy of uh, of of being a a student in this class. You are worthy of my my attention and my admiration." And, and I, as a as a you know, as a as a mem- as a, a sort of um, person of this community that people look up to, you are worthy. I'm, I'm anointing you. And, and so for her, it was like, you know, it's not just a a breakup, even though the man was older, someone that has authority and power over you saying that they love you, taking sort of advantage of you, um, in all of these sexual and emotional ways. And then and then dropping you, which is what he eventually did in a sort of, or allegedly did, sorry, in a very, um, a very certain manner um, that was very just exacting. And one day to the one hour to the next, it was over. Um, so I think her takeaway, the thing she would want people to know is, you know, like I, I was a kid and and I didn't know what I wanted. And this person kind of told it, he 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 put his what he wanted onto her and as a young woman she didn't she didn't know what to do but to to go along yeah interesting yeah when i think back to when i was her age you're just trying to feel like you matter at all and it's so shaky the foundation is so shaky that anything any bad incident can sort of take all that all that away one criticism, one bad grade, one breakup. And it makes total sense that at that age um, to have someone elevate you to that level could have that self-esteem boost at the same time as being very detrimental and traumatic in that it feels exploitative uh, over time. And especially looking back, you write about her account of that. I don't know if you want to spoil the end of the book with her story, but do you want to talk about the result of the trial and the uh, social media storm? I'm sure. I mean, what happened with Maggie was that the, he was acquitted on most of the counts. Uh, two of the accounts were, were dropped because one of the jurors actually had a, had a passed out and during the, the trial and was rushed to the hospital. And so, 
there was no conclusive result on a couple of the counts, which is which was interesting in itself. The juror allegedly said, I have to protect the children. And the idea was that she had felt bad about um, about agreeing to some of, you know, taking part in some of it. And also it had come out that she had been sexually abused as a young woman, which had not come out in the, in the initial vetting of the jurors. And so there was a lot going on with the trial itself. It was very, very complex. And after the teacher was acquitted, he was reinstated uh, with back pay. And Maggie was called a variety of names that you could imagine. And, and on Facebook, people were messaging her saying terrible things. She removed herself from all elements of social media. She stayed inside. She was massively depressed. She gained weight. She was suicidal. There was, I mean, she went to see multiple therapists. She was on multiple drugs. Um, it was very bad. And, and for many years, it was very bad. And so, and, and that was the fallout of what happened. And he, you know, who knows what happened in his personal life and, and what, what he felt and what his family felt. But, um, but for Maggie, since I, I've talked to her for years, I know what it was for her and it was awful. Right. Is she okay now or is she still struggling? She's a social worker. Um, She's actually doing wonderfully, and um, and it's great. And, and not only is she doing well, um, she's also been getting so many, so many letters and notes over social media, which she has recently come back on from young women saying, "You know, your story makes me feel seen. I had a similar situation." It's so funny that after after you. You, you start opening up a well of people telling you stories. You see how many people have either been assaulted or had relationships with their teachers or had just shame, shame and passion and different aspects that they do not talk about during the daylight with their friends. And to see it kind of, I just saw so much of that. And, and yeah, I mean, I just saw so much of the wide spectrum of human behavior that it, it's just interesting to, to see, it's just interesting to hear that we all have such similar experiences, but Maggie, I'm sorry to, I got off, um, went off onto a tangent, but Maggie's doing really, really great. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You mentioned your own journey along writing this book. How, how have you transformed if, if at all, or what, what have you learned from these stories? Um, you know, I want a lot of the, a lot of the times I was listening to people um, talk about, not I mean, assaults, yes, but even beyond assault, just experiences, the first times that they experienced sort of sexuality, whether it was it, their own desire or someone else's that they were either serving or, or being a part of, um, uh, whether complicitly or not, um, that I, so many of my own experiences rose to the surface of things that I had not remembered had not ever recalled and that's something that was really interesting to me because when I was talking to all these people if you talk to somebody for over two weeks or a month or six months or years like I did things will come up and with some of these people with a lot of the subjects things came up but months later years later and and the same thing happened for me after talking to these people I was like oh my god that same thing has happened to me but in this manner in this manner and so that, I would say that was the biggest thing was that just learning about learning about remembering about things that had happened to me, how they, how they shaped who I am today. One of the biggest things that I, I learned across all of nearly almost all of the women that I spoke to was how much um, our mothers figure into our desire and how we express it. And that's why I began and ended the book with, with a story of my own mother because she had passed away by the time I had started thinking about these things. And I felt like I didn't know. And the things that I didn't know, I wondered how they shaped what I did and the things, the little stuff that I did know, how did they shape the way that I thought? Yeah. The story that you tell about your mother, uh, the stories is really quite moving. You talk about how your mother was sexually abused in public repeatedly as a young person in Italy and by the end of the book she has passed away and I, I guess it pops into my head the question 
is your screenplay going to include you or do you know who's going to play you in, <laughs> in the no, showtime? That's quite a question that I've been, um, I've been batting around. It's an interesting question that you would ask that because it's something that, you know, it's about these three women. But, but it's also about you interviewing those three women. Yeah. And why, and why you even chose to write about them. Right. And also why are they, you know, how are they connected as the other? So it's, that's an interesting question because I've been, I've been wrestling with that one because as a writer, I don't like to write about myself and the prologue and the epilogue, I, I sort of was asked to put into it and I'm happy I did, but it wasn't my choice initially to bring myself into it. And so it's not my natural desire to do that. At the same time, it is something that from a sort of narrative perspective, I think might, might be, might be almost, I don't know about necessary, but might be prefer, you know, the right, quote unquote, right way to do it. I, I don't know. Very good question. It's something I think about every day. Well, why wouldn't you want yourself in it? I mean, there's a, there's just a certain sense of like writing about one, like the book is called three women. Right. And so, and, and one of the things that I wanted to do very much that uh, was keep myself out of it while I was telling their stories, obviously I'm in it to the extent that I'm translating their stories. And, you know, I, they've, most of the stuff in there is uh, all of it is, is what they said to me, but obviously, you know, I would use a different word here and there, but I really tried not to use words that were different from what they said. I tried, you know, I really was wanted to be in their heads and in their voices as much as possible, which is why I wanted to email and text with them so I could have just be constantly um, reminded of their voices uh, in both print and, and, and voice and, and in person and not in person. So, so for me, that was so important that to then have, it's called three women to then have this, you know, show based upon my book and have it include me in a way in which the book did not just feels, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I mean, it, as a writer who likes to observe and not, and not be involved, it, it's, it, you know, as a, I did not do what Gates Elise did. I did not sleep with the people I was writing about. So, you know, it just, I wanted to not be in it. But I do think that, as you say, it's kind of, it feels kind of almost like it, you can't do it the other way. Yeah, I can. I'm not a screenwriter or a producer or anything, but I can see the Showtime opening scene, which would be, <laughs> uh, it'd be you talking to your, or maybe it'd open with your mom. And you or your mom, it would start with. And then you talking to these women entering their world. And you'd sort of like be the proxy for the audience, the, the observer we would identify with your character. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, yes. I mean, it, it, it seems even haunting to hear you say that, but I, I know that that's the way it should go. <laughs> uh, just you know, have you thought about who you want to play you? <laughs> no, not even a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that it's never too late to start thinking about that. I mean, that'll be weird. Right. Or are you an act? Are you an actor? Can you act? Oh, you can play yourself. Not even, not even close. Absolutely not. I can't even act my marriage as though I, I, I'm, you know, there's no sort of pretending that the other person is right or, you know, no, there's no acting over here. It's just literally, it's quite literal. <laughs> so then the third story of the three women in your book, you write about, she uh, starts off in a marriage and she's with her husband and her have a sexual relationship in which, uh, and it's, it's the way you write about it. The way she tells the story is it's, it's, she doesn't really know if she wants to do this or not, but she goes along with it. And the husband wants her to have sex with other people while he watches. And uh, so what drew you to the Sloan story? So <clears throat> I had moved to Newport, Rhode Island, which for those who have not been, is a very seasonal a very seasonal place in the summer. It's quite it just teams with tourists. It's beautiful. Um, in the fall and winter, it shuts down a little bit. And then the people who remain, it's a very insular community. And I had moved there for several other people. There was a gay young man who at 19, I believe he was at the time, was a, was a professional life coach. And I was just taken with him and his experience um and there were several other people there too two of the men actually and, and one of them a woman and while i was interviewing and 
being with these people, I heard several rumors about this woman, Sloan, who uh, operated a restaurant with her husband in Newport. And one of the first rumors was that, uh, well, the first thing was she's so beautiful. She walks into a room, everybody looks, everybody um, puts their, their food down and just stares. And the, then the first rumor was that she was um, in, a, in a marriage where her husband liked to watch her be intimate with other men in front of him. Occasionally there were threesomes and occasionally, occasionally he would, she would have sex with a man or a couple down the street or in another city or another town and videotape it and sort of give him a, a video play by play. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then the second part of the rumor about her was that her husband wanted to have sex with her every day. And not only did she allow it, but she enjoyed it. And the sort of alarm with which that was conveyed to me was so intriguing because uh, it was almost, her narrative was almost as compelling as the way that the judgment around her narrative had taken shape. So this is another story of judgment from other people. Is that right? Yes. And you know, that's the thing. It's that, it's that I uh, did these, these three women, I didn't, I didn't so much choose them as they chose me. My first the first draft of this book had about 20 people of the hundreds I spoke to. I I probably had written 15 to 20, very, you know, between 5,000 words and 20,000 words. These women were the largest. I had hundreds of thousands of words on each of them. And the reason that they were the largest sections was because they told me the most, because they let me spend the most time with them. I, I moved into many people's communities and I hung out with them every day. I went to the gym with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and one of the things about uh, the, 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 one of the reasons I think that these three women gave me so much is because they were being judged so much and because they were being judged they couldn't they couldn't be who they were and so they were able to be who they were with me this sort of uh, observer this this non-judgmental person who literally was just trying to write a book and wanted only to listen and so i think that that's why judgment plays such a big part is because i think people who are judged people who are scared people who are who want to talk, people who are sad, people who are excited, the people who are experiencing extreme emotions are the ones who most naturally want to divulge them. What do they think of the book now that it's out? Maggie has said that it's given her closure, which has been wonderful. Um, So many young women have written to her. And on top of that, on Instagram, Abby Wambach, the soccer superstar who has always been Maggie's hero, but when she was in high school, she had posters of her up on her walls. A a goalie net was the back, was her headboard with Abby Wambach over it. She was, I mean, it was her hero. She is her hero, but when she was in high school, it was very, it was just a very big thing. Um, She held up a picture of the book that said, um, you know, she was reading it. She loved the book. And I wrote to her and I said, Maggie, you're Maggie's hero. And she publicly said, Maggie is my hero. And that for Maggie was this like insane thing. You know, it was just this beautiful, um, uh, just someone believing her, someone that she was inspired by and had helped her get through so many things was, was seeing her in the world and, and believing her. Um, and as for the other two women, they're unnamed. You know, there's a, there's a, 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 a for me and, and for them, a fear of, um, you know, I don't think, not I don't think, I know that nobody, including me, thought that the book was going to be as widely read as it's been. And I think that's, that the, the surprise of that has contributed to the fear of because more people are reading it, there's more of a chance of, of discovery. So that's mainly the, my concern with the other two. I think that they have the concern as well. Um, you know, I still talk to all three of them. I talk to Maggie daily. I'm, you know, I try to keep them all plugged in to, to the development so that they hear things from me first. And that's kind of how it's going. What what do you think the differences are between men and women when it comes to the topics of this book, if that makes any sense? Because as as a man myself, as I'm watching this, or as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking 
that, of course, as a man, I don't know what it's like to be a woman. There are very specific experiences for women that they go through that, that men will never know. And the book touches on that. But there also seem to be, to me, universal themes of insecurity, uh, loss, longing, um, confusion, rejection. Uh, but I, I just wanted to know from you what, how, how you saw the, the experiences of, of women being fundamentally different or, or not fundamentally different from men in, in, the, in the themes presented in this book. I think that women are, um, they are fundamentally different. Women are, women, from what I've, I've heard from women in, in relationships and women just in general, they, they are more, whereas men, heterosexual men I've seen tend to compartmentalize more and women, heterosexual women, but honestly across the spectrum of all sexual proclivities and orientations, women tend to not compartmentalize. And there's more of a sort of, uh, women have more, there's just more of a, it's a system of, 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 of complexity in their brain that works in a different way. And I, I found that there's more, there's more memory and there's more um, an analysis and there's a lot more thinking that goes into, into different aspects of the human experience. And so I, I think that translates to desire and how that, you know, and also societally, biologically, societally, Me Too movement wise, we're finally talking about what we don't want, but we're not so much talking about what we do want. And I think that, um, I think that that's, that's something that for women has been has been a big difference because men when men compete for a woman or for a job or for whatever it may be they are seen as like lions in the wild and and it's it's accepted and even celebrated and when women do the same thing it is and it's kind of the op it's it's sort of like oh it's catty why are they why does she want that why does she want something that he you know that kind of a an aspect. So yeah, I, th I think I saw many differences. As a uh, endorsers of your book, you have some pretty big names, Dave Eggers, Esther Perel, uh, actually endorse your book publicly here in the blurbs section on the back. Have, do you know Esther Perel? No, I, I oh. actually had never, um, I, I was obsessed. I mean, I am, I, I've been, she, I, she's been an idol of mine for a very long time. When I heard that come through the pipeline and it wasn't, um, it wasn't requested or anything in any way, that's been a lot of, you know, I didn't know any of these people who blurbed the book because I haven't really been a part of the writing community. So it's kind of been, um, it's been a surprise. And I, I wrote Dave Eggers a very long handwritten note saying how I, I was a, such a huge fan and I, you know, I didn't figure if he would, anything would come from it, but I, I just received this letter in the mail with his quote and a note saying, you know, that he loved it, et cetera. And it was just, I, it blew me away. And, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert kind of came out of nowhere. She just sent, she didn't even know who the right person to send it to was. She didn't know who my editor or my publicist was. So it was kind of, so a lot of these things have been really, amazing and out of nowhere and i think the generosity of of people who uh, uh, yeah it's just been wonderful it's been it, that part has been really something that has made me feel just i don't know grateful so at some point when the tv show is made uh, i i have a friend who i grew up with brian yorkie who wrote the 13 reasons oh, on, yeah. on on netflix and and his life, although he was pretty famous before having won a Tony Award for a musical that he wrote uh, and other sorts of things that he's done in, on Broadway and otherwise. But the 13 Reasons fame was pretty significant. And from the little I know, from, because he, he's so busy, I can't even talk to him anymore. But are you um, prepared for that onslaught? I mean, it's it's been happening, so I have literally no time for anything. And I have a four year old child and I'm traveling all the time. I am not, I mean, I am, I'm doing it right now and I know it's only going to get worse. So no, I am not. <laughs> I'm currently unprepared. I expect to be more so unprepared when it gets worse. 
do you have someone who helps you? I'm just curious. Do you have someone who helps you? Cause I, I just think like, okay, you go on like some talk show TV thing and you, you, the audience is there and you have three minutes and they ask you, you just never know what they're going to ask you. And I'm, I'm just, and I'm guessing you are, you've already experienced this of, you know, this, the, there's some explicit sex scenes in the book that I, I wonder if it challenges some people's sensibilities. And I, I'm just wondering if anyone helps you to prepare to answer such questions. Um, or if, or if you're just, cause you seem like a pretty relaxed, chill person. So maybe you're just like, <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'll just answer it truthfully. I don't care. No, you know, yeah, I, I do. I do. I do just want to answer things truthfully. I definitely, I'm not, um, I'm not guarded, but I also feel that I'm not guarded because I've done this. I've worked on this book for so long that I, um, you know, the, the things that I've done for it and the ways that I feel about the women and about human experience in general, at least the one that I, I only speak to what I've witnessed and heard. So I feel confident, obviously, because I've witnessed and heard those things because I've done it for 10 years. So I, I, um, yeah, I'm confident in that way in terms of getting up and speaking in front of crowds. Um, that is not natural to me. I do not like, I, I like talking to people, but I don't like talking to people in mass. Um, so no, it's not easy. And, um, I, but it's funny cause my husband saw me the other day or a couple of weeks ago rather. And he, I was like shaking before I went up and then I got up there and he was like, you didn't even seem like nervous at all. And I don't know. I think that, so, you know, something just happens to some, sometimes hopefully it just sort of like kick into gear and do what you have to do. But I am not chill. I am the opposite of chill, but thank you. I appreciate someone thinking I'm chill because <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is kind of this weird dichotomy or this weird irony that, authors are nerds that sit in rooms by themselves in front of their laptop and don't talk to anyone. And then when they become famous, they have to be thrust onto stages in front of people and suddenly have to now, um, you know, interact with thousands upon thousands of, of people. It is, um, and, but of course that's every author's dream, right? Is to, uh, achieve that sort of level of, of success. Well, what, what's your next uh, project going to be three more women? Um, no, I, uh, well, my novel is coming out next year. Um, and then I have a collection of stories after that. And um, beyond, you know, TV stuff, I've been working on a new nonfiction proposal. So I don't know why I'm continuing to do these things. I feel like when things are happening, it's better to just do them. I'm hoping that one day my goal is to just write short stories out in like rural England, like in the Cotswolds or similar. So I'm trying to work to get there. <laughs> What's your novel about? It is about, uh, it is about, a, it starts off with a woman who's having dinner with a married man and a man comes into the restaurant and shoots himself in front of her. And then she goes on this sort of um, cross country trip across. She leaves New York and goes to Los Angeles uh, to find a woman who holds the key to her past and why, she, why that situation happened to begin with, with the man in the beginning. Interesting. Did your interviews with women inspire anything about that novel? Oh, absolutely. It was a big part of that because there was so much that I didn't use in the book. Um, literally hundreds of thousands of words that were unused. I was able to at least use them in a, in a fictional sense, and, you know, kind of just use the, the feelings of them and some of the actual, you know, um, uh, anecdotes. Well, thanks, Lisa, for coming on the podcast. Again, the book is called Three Women, and it's available, and it's an easy read. Uh, it, every page is interesting. It moves pretty fast, and the, the lives are so richly depicted. Thank you, Kirk. Wait, can I ask you one question, or is it? Is Please. It, oh, okay. Was I on video the whole time? You were, but then you muted your video. 
But I wasn't recording the video, if that makes okay, sense. I was eating an egg because I haven't eaten all day. And I was like trying to eat in between talking. And so I'm very embarrassed now that I was on video the whole time. <laughs> No, it's, that's why you're, that's why I thought you're chill. You're like, okay, you know, she's hungry and she's going to oh eat. Oh my gosh, it. no, that is, I'm like, literally, I'm beyond, I was actually going to apologize to you for chewing. And then I was like, well, no, I don't want to ruin the pot. And if he doesn't even know that I'm eating, it's no big deal. But oh my God, I am beyond embarrassed, but you know, whatever, it's fine. I don't, cause I have, I've literally been doing um, interview after interview since 7am. So I have not eaten. So I, I chose the one time that I'm in on video to shove an egg in my mouth in between conversations. So I can see why you think I'm chill and no, I'm not. I'm horrified that that happened. No, it was fine. I, I, I figured as much. I was like, well, she's probably got a lot of interviews today and she needs to eat. And so I'm, I'm happy as a, <laughs> as a professor student, sometimes eat in my class. And you know, as long as it's not, Oh, I one time had a student that had a Subway sandwich and then she took uh, Lay's potato chips and like, you know, dumped the Lay's potato chips inside the Subway sandwich and then proceeded to eat it. And it was very loud. Uh, that was one of the times that annoyed me. But, um, but you know, a little bit of wow. cheering now and then never harmed anybody. Wow. I am so, well, whatever, I guess there's no way of, of undoing that, but um, thank <laughs> you for not, uh, I, I don't know. Oh my gosh. Were you just like, what is she doing? No, I was, I was like, okay, I, well, what I was wondering about, because there, <laughs> to be honest, there was, well, there was this one moment where you had the, the fork of food like up to your face while oh you were talking. Gosh. Oh my and God. What I, well, what I wanted to say to you, Lisa, was like, you know, feel free to eat, go for it. But you just seemed so relaxed about the whole thing. I thought, oh. well, you know, she, she doesn't need me to reassure her. She's. My God. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to crawl into a hole and just, that's the end of my day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. My listeners will love it. Believe me, they will. They'll. It'll just make you even more human than you already are. That's great. <laughs> oh my god. Um, well, Kirk, thank you for having me eat on your show, your podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, be so chill. Uh, <laughs> and wow. Okay. So that's how's that. Well, I, I usually sign off by saying to take care of yourself because you deserve it. But what I should instead say is everyone out there, please eat when you want and be chill because you deserve it. You really, really do. <laughs>